Welcome to Punch Card Investing, a weekly show dedicated to all things value investing. Whether it be analyzing companies, pitching ideas, or discussing moves by the best investors in the world, we're trying to get one step closer to punching an investment off of our cards. Let's, Let's get, get started. started. There we go. You got to love the intro, Jason. What's your what, what's your thoughts on the punch card intro? Um, I think I want Jack to invite me back on the show, so I'm not going to give my thoughts. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yes, we've got a we've got a short crew today, but we've um, given Jason the call up, and he's uh, gladly given us some of his time. So this should be a yeah. fun one. I feel like Jason, you always bring the witty jokes, bit of energy to the show. So it's good to have you back. But before you even start streaming, isn't that correct, Tom? I was on fire before we started going yeah. live. Yeah. So I already know all the jokes that you're going to actually say during the stream. <laughs> I'll, so I'll, I'll make sure I, I'll make sure I pretend to laugh. Okay, good. Like you always <laughs> do. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. All right. So the topic of this one, um, man, what does Jack even say at the start of these? I'm just going to forget that and, and get straight into the topic. But um Basically, the, the plan for this one is to talk through some of the best investors to ever do it, essentially. Um, some of you may have seen the chart that's showing in our background at the moment, and I will share uh, the proper version of it so you can see what that is all about. There's something Frank shared on Twitter wow. a little while back. The chart. And it's, yeah, and it's essentially a matrix of yeah some of the most impressive investment track records out there. So we've obviously got people... Um, cranking out massive returns the likes of joel greenblatt um but over smaller lengths of time and then we've got way out on the right hand side people like walter schloss warren buffett who did it for decades and decades and decades and cranked out double digit plus returns so um frank i think you're gonna kick us off for this one who do you want to start with here yeah so i'm gonna start with shelby davis which is one that um, some people probably haven't heard of or don't know about too much but you can see him there on the chart um, I think the longer term outperformance is more impressive than that short term. Um, of course, if you're all the way up near Joel Greenblatt, who I think had 40% of your returns, um, that's an outperformance chart. So what's that? 27% or so it looks like he was outperforming over about 20 years. Like that is very impressive. But when you're moving past 30 or 40 years, I think is where um, that's truly the most value creating returns. I mean, that's why Buffett is referred to as one of the best to ever do it. Um, on the chart, it looks like about 57 years or so. It's probably longer than that now, closer to 60 years of about 10%, between 10 and 15% outperformance. So Shelby Davis is towards that end. Um, I think the three best track records, um, at least that's known of, is Shelby Davis, Buffett, and Walter Sloss. Um, but Shelby Davis first. If you want, Tom, you can just scroll up on that thread um, so I can get the numbers exactly right, the very first um, tweet in there. So he turned $50,000 into, I'll just double check, $900 million, um, and starting to invest at 38 years old, which is pretty crazy, a very late start. Um, and if he pro probably start those returns earlier, if he started investing at 20 years old, he probably would be referred to as better than Buffett, um, assuming that he could keep that track record up. So 47 years, 23.2% annual return. Um, our performance-wise, I'm not sure what the S&P 500 done exactly, but it's so long-term that we can assume it's around 8 to 10%. So pretty incredible our performance over a long time period. And the interesting thing about him, I think, to me, is that he was very circle of competence focused. Almost all of his investments were in insurance companies. There's a few exceptions to that rule, but um, he started in the insurance industry and that's something that he knew well. So he just bought the highest quality and cheapest insurance companies and held them for a very long time. Most of his investments were very long-term, um, which is another thing I really like about him. It's very Buffett-like the approach that he follows, but even more narrows down on that circle of competence. Uh, he calls his approach the Davis double, which essentially is just focusing on the two factors that drive shareholder returns, um, earnings growth and PE ratio, really. So if you have 
a low PE ratio and you can get that multiple expansion. That's one thing that drives returns. And then if you pair that with earnings growth, then that's where the best returns can come from, um, which is something Chris Meyer talks about in his book, 100 Baggers, as well, which I think he does even mention Shelby Davis in there, unless I'm mistaken. But, um, yeah, that's pretty much how he did it. He focused on an industry he did really well and invested for a really long term and had incredible results. Did he manage money for people, Frank? Yeah, so he did have a fund um, as well. Um, and I'm assuming part of those returns are from that fund, which is now still managed. I think it's called the Davis Fund by some of his grandsons maybe. And one of his grandsons, uh, Chris Davis, I think it is, is a board member on Berkshire Hathaway as well. So his family really followed out his principles in investing and have continued to grow that wealth. How do you hear about him? Um, I, I read the book Davis Dynasty originally, which was shared to me by a friend. Um, the, the name was something I had just come across but didn't know too much about until I actually read the book. He was just one of those guys that has an incredible long-term record. So the name gets thrown out there every now and then, and I eventually went and did some research on him. And it was even more impressive, really. Question for you guys, uh, if I might, might Tom, for the about the Davis Double. Uh, multiple expansion and earnings growth, earnings per share growth. Um, yeah. When I first started investing before I had listened to this show, so I wasn't very good until I learned from you guys. Um, I, I would often like find cheap PE stocks and I would think party cities at a PE of four, they've been profitable for 20 years. That's ridiculous. They should be at a PE of 10. I'm going to double my money. Of course that didn't happen um and so i've always, i've kind of been hesitant to rely on multiple expansion because it's not how can i predict what the market f- should value something like hershey's at versus something like carmax or whatever i've kind of lost my confidence in myself to kind of be able to do that i don't know if anyone can do that um so i am biased towards focused on growing companies companies that are growing their earnings per share growth and not relying on that multiple expansion to make your investment. How does that sit with you guys? Do you guys factor multiple expansion into your investments? Because I know a lot of people do. Yeah, so I think um, predicting earnings growth is almost just as difficult. Um, Mm. I I do agree that I would uh, more heavily preference earnings growth than multiple expansion, but I wouldn't invest in something unless I thought there was a chance of multiple expansion. So if I think something's trading at five times PE and I think it's worth 10, I'm not going to factor that in necessary to guarantee me that extra double coming from that multiple expansion, but I would want the possibility and I would want to see some kind of um, data out there that suggests it should be worth more than what it is. And if you are accurate with what the earnings growth can be um, and you know something's going to grow at 20% APS over the next five years and you're confident of that, then it's safe to assume it's worth more than five times earnings if that's what it is. If you're just looking at a um, big data set of similar similar companies, I guess they're competitors in the industry, what they're worth, yeah. what multiples they achieve, the market environment, all of those things. So I would at least want to have the possibility of multiple expansion, but I wouldn't completely rely on it. I think you're right in saying earnings per share growth is more important, but I think mm. um, there's mistakes to be made on both sides of that. Definitely think it can help you set up multi-baggers if you kind of, even if you aren't relying on multiple expansion, if like you're saying, you kind of make that part of your investment thesis, it probably will bias you towards good stuff that's cheap when it's cheap. Uh, So that can be kind of a good uh, mental model, if you will. I remember in the book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, um, he interviewed, uh, William Green interviewed someone from Fidelity. And that's where I kind of got that line of thinking. That guy's point was like, look, I don't know what something should be valued at. That's the market's job. My job is to find growing businesses and bet on them and be right about that and just make sure I don't buy stuff too expensive. And that that really uh, stuck with me since then. What about you, Tom? Do you, how do you, how does multiple expansion factor into your decisions? Yeah, I think um, I'm reasonably well aligned with what Frank's saying. I think um, trying to understand earnings growth is definitely the place to start. And then <clears throat> you just don't want to overpay for it. I guess you, you don't want the multiple expansion component of your return to be a negative number. <laughs> like you want to potentially yeah. have the possibility of multiple expansion, but you don't want to 
have a high prob- probability of multiple compression, I guess is the, the way I'd look at it. And I guess I kind of do it just in reverse because with my investment in Alphabet, definitely part of my thinking was, okay, if they do earn this in five years, it would be ridiculous for them to trade at a PE of seven or an enterprise value to price of seven to 10. And so it did kind of factor into my decision. So, yeah, I mean, it makes a huge, it makes a huge difference. Like I, w- I was actually looking at Buffett's Apple investment for a, a, a video earlier. This Buffett and, and Rothman. Buffett and Rothman. Yes. Both of those. We did invest it around the same time and we have both hold yeah, yeah. held. And I don't know if you, why you didn't put my name in the title, if you were concerned about like copyright <laughs> or something, but you have my permission, Tom, if after the no, show, I, you want to say Buffett and Rothman's investment in Apple, feel free to update your video. I think it'll do better. No, yeah. I was concerned about um, just the excessive YouTube growth being too much for me. So I wanted to keep it you yeah, know, okay. under wraps with just using Buffett. Yeah. So, okay. um, but but to to that point, I mean, since September, since the year ended September 16, um, Apple's had about a double, a little over a double in net income. They've had about a 33% increase in sort of the per share ownership of Apple from the buybacks. Um, oh, yeah. And then they have had not quite a double in PE ratio. Depends kind of where you, where you have that average number p kind of sitting with buffer buying it but yeah you combine all those factors together and you get to the the tom triple the, the, the davis double has become the tom triple you factor in five <laughs> yeah it could be like well, the we need to find a good name for like the i don't know the what the rothman quadruple if you had a dividend in there or something uh well I'm sure the we, davis I'm sure there's something there the davis double is earnings per share growth i think to clear ah, it up so okay. it does factor in buybacks as well Um, And there's just a comment there from James that says growth of cash flow is more important than earnings. Um, I guess when we kind of casually talk about earnings growth, we are thinking about maybe owner's earnings, free cash flow, any of those things that drive returns. So, And earnings per share does drive returns, but whether you want to think about cash flows or owner's earnings, um, it's a similar type type of correlation between the stock price if that number is growing over time. Yeah. The Frank Five. (laughs) It's catchy. What are the five though? I don't know. <laughs> Someone can think about that and maybe comment the Frank Five, all the components in there. Um, any other investors you wanted to share, Frank? Um, the other one I'll quickly touch on, I guess, that's very similar is Walter Sloss. So um, his track record is about 47 years as well. Um, and the annual return, I'll just double check this number on my screen, I think is 21 around 21%. Um, after fees, it's about 16%, but regardless, he was achieving 21% returns over 47 years. Um, and he did it with a pretty interesting strategy. He was a one-man shop the whole time. He did run a fund as well. He, at one point, he was part of the Benjamin Graham course with um, Warren Buffett as well. Um, but he kind of followed that style a lot more stricter than Buffett did. He didn't move away to this kind of quality at a reasonable price. He really stuck to the net nets in a diversified portfolio. He owned up to hundreds of stocks at a time. Um, So he's kind of proving the point that being diversified can lead to outsized returns over a long period. Um, But yeah, essentially all net nets or very deep value stocks, um, a few kind of special situations in there as well. Um, And he did that for a very long time, a really quantitative rather than qualitative approach did it all on his own and kind of worked a typical nine to five days, uh, nine to five, five hour day, didn't put in extra hours, didn't work weekends. Um, so I really like that. He kind of showed that you can get these exceptional returns without um, ruining the rest of your life by just being hyper-focused, which maybe Buffett could fall into that category where he kind of, his family might've been sacrificed for the investment returns over time. Um, but Walter Sloss really stuck to keeping it simple, followed the same approach for a long time and had incredible returns. So that's another one I really like. I was I was no. actually thinking thinking about him the other day because uh, I, I live in the world of uh, artificial intelligence with my day job. And I'm seeing that um, I'm seeing computers and artificial intelligence outperform human beings on a consistent basis. And 
I see that in the marketing industry. And then I think about the other industry uh, that I'm focused on, which is the investment industry and business. And I was wondering how proof, how AI proof that this industry is, if it even is. And I was thinking the more kind of, and well, I'll talk about this with my investors, the more kind of qualitative you get and away from the quantitative, I think you're, that's the best you can do to kind of be AI proof. Uh, cause you can focus on the human judgments and things that just computers can't really understand yet. But my understanding of Walter Schlosh, Schlosh is that it was a lot of it pretty, it was basically numbers. Like it was pretty much a very Ben Graham style. And, um, I would just question if that if that can even get done these days uh, or if algor if uh, quantitative hedge funds have just kind of just zeroed out that ability to generate alpha. Uh, so I was just thinking about that this week. Yeah, I think his approach is certainly something that could be put into an algorithm at some point in time. Um, and I'm sure there's funds out there doing that. Um, I'm blanking on the guy's name. Where's someone? Um run to fund and he has a few different quantitative approaches. Um, and one of them is a kind of deep value strategy. Then there's the opposite end of the spectrum where he focuses on momentum, both strategies mm -hmm. outperform. So um, I, I don't think it goes away just because of AI um, unless like an excessive amount of these algorithms are kind of investing in the market and the market kind of shifts towards that, which, which is possible over time because that can create, I guess, a more efficient market if that was the case, but there's always ways to add that, like you said, the human factor into it, the qualitative just, side of investing that can't really disappear. And I'm thinking now that the person that the machine is trading with is, is still in a large part humans. And so as long as those humans are being humans, uh, it may be tough to kind of just zero out the ability to make money that way. I think it also, his style, I would assume has to do with the attitude of the market in general if it's like a market like the last decade, that style may not do too well because there was nothing maybe going on with those kind of businesses. And the, those kind of businesses that did meet the net net or whatever were probably junkers. But um, it, if the market stays depressed like it did in the 70s, it might be a, a time to kind of think that way. Uh, Frank, did, did you mention a book with the Davis Double? Oh, yeah, it's called... I did say that question back there from someone. Uh, it's called the Davis Dynasty which, um, yeah, I would recommend that book if you haven't really read too much about Davis, I guess. If, you, if you've if you read enough online, you would kind of get the gist of that whole book, but it, it is a good uh, book worth reading, I think. Great. Nice. Cool. Jason, I, heard, I you were telling us before the show you got a few investors you're, you're keen to share. Who, who are they? Yeah, well, th I mean, this week with Carvana, I've been up over 100%. In Carvana within the last six months, and now I'm down 20%. So the movements in the stock price uh, had me thinking about it this week. And um, the two guys that I've kind of cloned on this investment are Cliff Sosin, and who I think people are more familiar with than the second investor, Joe Frankenfield from Saga Partners. Um, Joe Frankenfield puts puts his write ups out there online at sagapartners.com, and his write up. Uh, really was a big influence on me on, on my Carvana investment. And I guess the, the big point about these two guys is that like, uh, yes, the numbers matter, uh, obviously. And I'm sure these guys look at numbers all the time and I know they do, but at the same time, there's this other qualitative aspect to investing, which is capitalism is competition. And how is this business going to do over the next decade and what will their place in this industry look like and will they take market share do they offer something better and it seems like these guys are very focused on um those kind of qualitative factors and and actually not just looking at numbers on the page doing that yes but also realizing we live in a world and we live in the business world and it's competition and really trying to think through that uh and i like doing that i'm very attracted to that because i think that's where uh, a ton of the outlier performance can come when you're not just talking about a double in four years or whatever, but you're talking about a, a 50 bagger over decades or a hundred bagger over decades. And so um, these guys have really influenced my investing and obviously Cliff Sosin, there's a bunch of stuff on YouTube, a bunch of interviews and stuff. And then Joe Frankenfield has all these uh, write-ups on his website and, and a few interviews on YouTube as well. So I would point people in that, those directions. 
And um, just to add on Cliff Sosen, um, I'm not sure his track record. I think it's about over a 12 or 13 year time period, but he was really incredibly outperforming, kind of moving towards that Joel Greenblatt type territory until this year where um, I'm sure his portfolio is down significantly. But I do think he was averaging around 30% annual returns from memory. I don't know if you know that off the top of your head, Jason, or maybe Tom. I think I even heard it in a video of yours. That's it, I think it, 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 yeah. it had to. I, I'm pretty sure it was over 30 percent for like almost a decade, maybe. Or a yeah, decade, I think that's like that. about what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of it was from Carvana from memory. Like that was a what 40 yeah. percent position at the peak or something, Jason. Yeah, it, you can see on like Whale Wisdom his <laughs> his 13F. I don't think it's it. Sometimes it's not. My recollection is it's it's not all of the assets under management, but it's like a very large chunk, and he is very uh, uh, very concentrated in that portfolio. I don't know what what result it got up to in terms of uh, allocation, but it was something very very big. Uh, he's he, I've listened to some podcasts where he's talked about like he won't go over a certain amount uh, on the purchase side, but he's willing to kind of let the flowers grow, uh, like Buffett talks about. So, um, just to give you an example. Um, this week, uh, CarMax, not Carvana, but CarMax uh, had a very rough quarter and surprised the market. And their stock had one of the worst days um, in 20 years. And it was down 25% in a day. Carvana was also down on the day because of that CarMax news. And most people in the investment world said, oh, CarMax did bad. Carvana, it must mean they're doing bad this quarter as well. And so we're going to sell out of it. And so Cliff Sosen tweets on this day, I'm always amazed, and by his Twitter is at Clifford Sosen. He says, I'm always amazed how investors don't understand that a business's competitor's poor results make that business's results better by comparison. Example, or ex-monopolies, so except for monopolies, competition and business is all a relative game. I think what he meant is he meant like uh, CarMax doing like basically the way I took that and the way I was thinking is, oh, heads up, everybody, CarMax might be doing worse because Carvana is doing better. And so that kind of goes to that thinking about uh, market share and just real business results in the real world. So I love that kind of stuff. So I think that I agree and disagree with that. Fundamentally, I guess that's true. Um, one side of the competition is going to be doing better than the other, but there are macro economic factors that could drive a whole industry down regardless. So I know investors often look sure. at um, Snapchat, um, their earnings come out and they assume that Facebook and Twitter are going to have similar results. And sometimes that is a reasonable factor to follow um, if it's the industry factor. But yeah, I, I get where he's coming from there, but I think it goes both ways. Sometimes competition results can be useful to know how your business is going to perform. Um, but on the flip side, like Cliff Sosen says, it could be that the competition is actually doing better and taking market share. Yeah. And I saw some beautiful ads this week with Carvana advertising how they're the easiest way for someone to, in case no one knows yet, um, I'm just trying to help people with their life. You can sell your car to Carvana and they'll come pick it up from your house. Uh, and they're promoting that now in their ads very effectively. And that can give them an edge because they'll, they'll have a cheaper access to vehicles. So biggest and most just profitable car dealership in the world use car seller in the world that's the that's the goal the, i'm just the curious march, the mar, we should mar, get carbon mar, a sponsorship me, on here excuse me the march <laughs> continues go ahead yeah, since you've hijacked up. the show and turned it into a carvana <laughs> show already um, i'm curious how you think about bankruptcy which is a real possibility for carvana um, obviously you would weight that lower but what what do you think the probability of a bankruptcy is and sure. how much yeah. is a factor how much you would make an investment into it that's exactly it, it impacts how much i'm willing to invest in it so um the answer is when i think about an alphabet it's zero percent and so i'm willing to bet very very big when i think about carvana i don't know if it's five percent or like i don't think it's this high but or fifty percent but i know it's a real concern and i know it's it very well could be out of the company's control depending on if the macro gets crazy horrible google's not going out of business but or alphabet's not but carvana could and so i just leave it at that and for them i've kept it at a position of 10 percent in terms of the cost uh, that's what i've been willing to do to do um i've been looking at leaps lately and options and it does influence uh the way i think about that as well because potentially 
a leap could be a way to access the same amount of shares, but risking less capital capital that could get wiped out. Uh, so I've been thinking about that as well. And I got to say, it's not really a comfortable thing. I don't like investing in businesses where this could happen. Um, and I wouldn't with a lot of my capital, but it's uh, it, the upside so big, it it's why I'm doing it. But uh, it's not, a, it's not a, a good feeling once you get up to a certain point of uh, allocation, I think. And that's how I'm dealing with it. It's just allocation. Yeah. The and water's up fair. to the ankles. <laughs> yeah. Or the calves or whatever but with carvana it's it's mid calf so i can just step out of it if i if i need to mm -hmm. nice. but anyway qualitative i mean do you guys um what kind of role does that play for you like i guess alibaba is a good example they have real competition as i understand it um so how do you kind of factor that in when you make a decision do you want to take that first frank are we just talking like qualitative, quantitative? Well, let, let me let, let me ask you this. Too? Let me ask you this. Part of the Carvana thesis is that they are going to take market share. If they take market share, just based on how big those the market is, they're going to make this kind of revenue and earn these kind of profits <laughs> five years out, ten years out from now. Obviously, that's a very difficult game to play because it's hard to predict things that far out. Do you guys ever do that with your investments? Do you think about where companies are going to be in ten years and allow that to maybe allow you to buy something that would seem expensive uh, in today's kind of valuation. Yeah, I, I I mean, I basically did exactly that with Alibaba's e-commerce business with some of their 2036 or whatever it is, targets of- um, Wow, and the cloud, And right? elective customers and- Yeah, but I mean, you, you look at that stuff and you try and figure out how realistic you think it is, but- then yeah. obviously price is a factor as well. Like if um, if they have to grow a hundred times and you're paying some huge multiple of earnings or sales or something, um, and you have to make all sorts of heroic assumptions, that's hard for me to get kind of across the line. But um, if the bar yeah. doesn't seem that high, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, I um, probably most of the positions I invest in, I'll, they lean towards the qualitative side of investing where I'm really looking at business quality and management and where it's going to be long term in the future. But um, there's a lot of companies where I could be very happy with the qualitative side of it. But then you look at valuation, and it's just not something I'm comfortable with. So I'm not yeah. willing to pay up for a business, even if the growth could be exceptional. Um, which is why Carvana made no sense to me, for example, when it was at its peak, the growth and where it could go in a low interest rate environment was it was a huge market share that they're kind of tackling. And the growth was great, but the valuation was just insane. Um, that story could be different now, of course. Yeah. Valuations. I don't even know the valuation at the moment, but obviously it's a lot different than it once was. So is the future growth prospects. But yeah, qualitative you is know, the most important part, but you can't sacrifice valuation for you know, quality. You know, Frank, uh, sometimes I, I run the numbers, like when I run the numbers on this Carvon investment and I think about, you know, let's say they get to 10% market share or... Yeah, to say 10%, where are they going to be um, and what would they be valued at? And whether it's, I don't know if I'm doing this with 10% market share or 20% or whatever, but when I kind of get to the promised land sometimes and I run the numbers, it basically gets back to, to where it was, at least in the medium term. So to your point, it, it did seem very frothy uh, during the during the pandemic. And there was uh, some uh, some insider selling at the time too. Um, and so that maybe they saw that as well, assuming that's why they sold. They didn't sell all, but they sold some, sold some. And then they bought back when it when it dropped. We've got a super chat here on Carvana, and then I might pull us back on track after this one. But um, thanks for the super chat, Compound15. Uh, how does Carvana compete with Copart? Is that something you're familiar with? And just before you tackle that one, Jason, I know Compound, he is a, uh, shareholder in Copart, or at least was, probably still is. Um, I don't know how the companies actually compete with each other at all. I don't understand the business model of either companies perfectly, but I wouldn't think they're direct competition. If you could clarify that compound in the comments, that would be great too. Then I'd have maybe a bit better of an opinion. Otherwise, Jason, what do you think? 
I don't know. I'm not very familiar with Copart. I know people in the value world kind of have looked at it uh, as a compounder. And when I look it up online, it says a, a vehicle auction and remarketing service. And so my understanding of Carvana, when I think about their competition, I think of CarMax, I think about the used car dealers, uh, the big brand names, uh, but then also the small ones down the street um, and trying to take market share from them. Of course, they bought Adesa and now they're in the, the auction business. Um, but other than that, I don't know where they would compete with them because, and mostly that's due to a lack of being familiar with Copart. Um, and as far as I know with Copart, that's one of those typical examples of a very high quality business and has been for a very long time and probably has a very long runway left to go. Um, but it's that valuation that I think I, I'm sure compound after talking to him back and forth would disagree with this, but it does seem towards the frothier valuation. Maybe it's fair value, but I don't think it's necessarily undervalued. Um, it's just one aspect, but yeah. Um, I don't know how directly they can peak. They just don't understand the business as well enough. Yep. Yep. Nice. Cool. Um, well, I might pull us away from Carvana. <laughs> I guess I think we've covered that enough. Um, but well, I let me guess yours. I'm, I'm going to guess Buffett. Is one of yours Buffett? Did I not tell you who I'm covering before we went live? <laughs> um, maybe, did, that was, maybe that was just Frank. No, I was going to talk about our namesake. I thought it would be a shame okay. for us to do a punch card investing stream on great investors and not talk about Mr. Punch Card himself, Norbert Lou. So, um, yeah, that, that's who I'm going to cover. Um, unfortunately for us, like the information that's out there on Norbert Lou is very, it's kind of few and far between. I, I don't I don't even know if you guys have ever seen a picture of Norbert Lou. I don't even know what the guy looks like, but um there is a really good article from um, from 2011, uh, an interview that was done with Norbert Lou, which kind of revealed a few of the things that, that he does in his fund. And I just kind of like the way that he, he operates. He's clearly a very private individual. Um, I first heard of him sort of indirectly through a Joel Greenblatt lecture where he was talking about this guy, Charlie 479 from the Value Investors Club, just crushing it with all these... Um, all these different stock ideas like winning the five thousand dollar weekly prize on the value investors club kind of time after time after time and um you know he had this massive multi-bag with nvr and a few kind of other stocks and it turns out that 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 was norbert lou and joel greenblatt actually kind of put the seed capital into norbert lou's fund so um just a few kind of stats from that 2011 article so the punch card uh, management fund had been running has been running since June 2004. So I haven't seen any return data since this article came out in 2011. But at that stage, at least, um, he had returned 14.5% annualized versus the S&P only 2.2% annualized over that same period of time. The S&P was pretty flat um, throughout that period. Uh, on average, through that time frame, he also had about 25% cash. So wasn't even fully invested that kind of includes cash just sitting idle um he had 90 percent of his net worth on the fund so kind of cool to see that alignment with his investors and he really held more than six stocks so um i just kind of like the way he operates he seems to epitomize the whole actual punch card strategy like it's pretty big news when norbert Lou puts on a new position um and a couple of the insights in terms of actual investment strategy that I kind of pulled out of the article, other than standard stuff you've probably heard a lot of times before about buy good businesses at reasonable prices. Um, there were a couple of things that helped Norbert Lou be pretty successful with a few companies. One of them was a big focus on um, share repurchases at cheap prices. That was one of the big drivers behind his success in NVR. Uh, and the other was kind of learning from other successful investments that idols of his had made over time. So yeah. looking at investments like, uh, you know, Berkshire's holding and Coca-Cola, which clearly did very well. And one of the big drivers behind the success of that investment was Coke having pricing power, basically. So he kind of scoured the world pretty much and and tried to look for other food and beverage companies that might have similar characteristics and he found an argentinian beer company called uh, quinza i think i think it's uh, pronounced so if you want to learn kind of the full story about how that investment played out i'd, I'd check out the article which um if you just 
Google interview with Norbert Lou that that should come up. But um, yeah, I, I really like what he's up to. Not sure if you guys have anything to add on on Norbert. Uh, he's not Pretty one that I've followed too closely. Um, I do look at his 13F as it comes out. Um, but beyond that, I didn't know too much about him. Um, looking at his portfolio, though, I can see it's the type of strategy that I like. Obviously, it's in the name of the fund that he runs. So um, definitely an interesting yeah. investor. And he does invest in a lot of smaller companies as well, which is part of what I like. Um, he does invest in large companies, but there's a couple of micro caps that come and go from that portfolio. So it is one I like to follow pretty closely. Nice. Tom, um, I don't I don't follow him that much. I'm aware of him. I've read that article and it's a very impressive record, but I, I, one of the things I do a lot of is cloning. And the reason I don't really follow him that much is because he do, it doesn't seem like he wants to f- be followed. Um, because he doesn't put hardly any anything out. And so one of the deals with cloning is I really like to get in kind of think the same way or understand how the super investors are thinking. Um, Cause that really helps with the uh, my investing decisions. And so if I was to look at his portfolio, I, which I do and for maybe idea sourcing, there's not really much I can take beyond some ideas because I don't really know how he thinks about investing other than, that one article out there, you know, so I've kind of stayed away other than kind of seeing what he's in, uh, but the times he's been in stuff, it's been stuff where I've looked at it and I'm like, uh, you know, it's not really clicking with me. I, I, I think he's in Winnebago according to the filings, which is close to your mm-hmm. Thor investment. So. Yep. But yep, I will that, say I, I, I read the, I read the NVR, uh, write up on, um, the value investors club and it was good and uh the uh the land option thing was very interesting as were the buybacks and there's a company called Polte group a home builder and i don't know the extent that they're doing this but they are highlighting in their recent presentation that they are buying land options as opposed to buying a bunch of land and they are very focused on buybacks and so the next nvr i don't know but um there is another home builder out there doing the options and buyback strategy, at least say they're doing it. So I'm, it's on my list of something to look into. Yeah. Interesting. I know, um, countryside partnerships is a stock that Norbert Lou got into pretty recently, which is another home builder doing buybacks. I think I might have to dig into it. Not sure if you guys know, but I think they may have recently been acquired possibly and taken private. So yeah, there's some kind of merger. I think the company is Vistry, uh, over yeah, in the yeah. UK. Yeah. Nice. Um, I saw we had a super chat earlier from Jonathan. So if you've got a question, Jonathan, I'm not sure if it's your one on on index funds. Maybe we can tackle that. Just let us know in the comments if that's the one you wanted us to to talk about, and then we can come back to that. Um, any other investors you guys wanted to wanted to chat about, or should we take some questions? Or Jason, I know you've been looking at a couple of different investment situations recently. We had the Porsche IPO. Do you want to cover that maybe? Well, I just want to say um, that I just want to share with you guys the way I, I look at Buffett um, and Munger and how different a level I kind of put them on versus everybody else. Uh, and of course, for me, my Mount Rushmore, Lilu, Guy Spear and Ted and Todd and um, Monish are also on there because they're kind of like direct disciples uh, from those guys. But I think I saw Monish talk one time where he, he was just talking about how lucky we are to be alive during the time of Buffett and Munger and watch them invest and kind of it made me think and I agree with the sentiment he was getting at which is like this is Mozart this is like as good as it will ever get these guys are geniuses and I what I try to do is I try to just focus on them pretty much and then the other guys on my Mount Rushmore and for me to be honest there's a lot of impressive track records out there but a lot of these guys stopped doing it A lot of these guys don't have impressive track records uh, after they stop doing it. And a lot of these guys are selling, to be honest. Um, Everyone's kind of, uh, you have to think about their own interests, which Guy Spear tells us to do. You got to think about people's own interests. And so for me, I kind of follow the Buffett and Munger school, the direct disciples, and then um, everybody else I kind of look at it on a different level. So that's just kind of my little rant about these super investors and then everybody else. 
I like it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I've, coach, been, I've, been, I've been, oh, I was going to say, Tom, I have been busy. So if you want to talk about some of those investments, I'm happy to. Um, yeah, where, where do you want to start? Well, I think early on there was a question about Porsche. Uh, Matt, just like the fifth comment earlier tonight. Mm, what time? Oh, just like if you go to the very top, uh, 937 my time. But he said, he said, can someone give an update on Porsche? I didn't invest in it, but curious how it has turned out so far. And so this has been kind of an incredible thing to watch. Um, we talked about it here on a few weeks ago, so there's no need to go into it. But essentially, um, Porsche SE owns a big chunk of uh, Porsche and a big chunk of uh, Volkswagen. And it's definitely undervalued based on just what they own on their balance sheet. And everyone thought, okay, well, when Volkswagen spins off Porsche AG and everyone sees the value of Porsche, which they did, and it traded at the high end of its IPO range and, and stayed there for a few days that it's been public, people would recognize the value that is inside of Porsche SE. They did not. The stock is down 18% from the IPO just a few days ago. And there was a very insightful comment that I saw on Twitter a couple weeks ago where someone said, what if people just sell off Volkswagen and sell off Porsche SE because they can go buy Porsche AG directly? And it appears to me that that's what happened. And people could say the market is being irrational. I would say I would agree with that because on the day um, it IPO during parts of that day, Porsche AG was worth more than Volkswagen. And Volkswagen owns Porsche, 75% still of Porsche AG, and also makes another $15 billion of operating earnings. So um, it's just kind of crazy to see what happened. But at the same time, I tried to put myself in the shoes of the other people on the other side of the trade. And there's a lack of confidence in the management at Porsche SE for their ability to cap, to get the value to actually be crystallized and get the get the market to appreciate the value. And if you're a short-term investor, um, that's definitely a fair take because will they do that in the next year? Who knows? They haven't done it in previous years. Um, and I can see that point of view. Um, so I was surprised at first, but the more I thought about it, it the more it made sense. I do still think it's undervalued. And um, it was just very interesting to see that play out differently uh, than expected and try to figure out why. One final thing I'll say. I think a lot of market participants who were in Porsche SE go and who were in Volkswagen go, why should I own these companies where I don't trust the management? I'm going to go buy Porsche AG directly and get access to Porsche directly. I think what they don't understand is that the families behind Porsche SE still control Porsche AG because they control Volkswagen and they own a big chunk of Porsche AG directly now. So just want to throw that out there. Time will tell, but it was extremely interesting to watch that play out in an opposite way than I thought it would. Yeah. And are you just, you're just sitting on that position. It's like a single digit percentage bet for you. For yeah. Like three, per, three, per, three mm -hmm. percent or so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're just going to see how it plays out basically. Yeah. I'm going to, I feel very, very good about the downside. Um, I don't know, 50 cents on the dollar right now, something like that. And that's under conservative assumptions and I'll just let it ride and kind of see, 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 how they do over time and, and also keep an eye on management and see what they do uh, to kind of get this value to be unlocked. Uh, and I will say I was very impressed with the way they attempted to unlock value or made things more valuable for Porsche SE shareholders through this whole deal. Uh, so I, at this point in time, I do have confidence that they want the value to be unlocked along with other shareholders. Cool. Um, people are proud of you in the comments, Frank, for finally finishing that beer, by the way. It's not quite finished yet. Oh, okay. I seen him <laughs> talking about it, so I kept on putting it closer to the camera. <laughs> it was getting attention. Yeah. Are we sponsored by Furphy? I wish. If Furphy yeah. are watching, reach out. <laughs> yeah. All right. Should we take some questions? Um, I've seen one from Jonathan Morris has been talking about the index again. He was the one that did the super chat. 
Oh, yeah. um, so if you just want to pull up his original one where he said something about not outperforming, just below his super chat. Yep. Um, yeah, so this is one I find pretty interesting. I somewhat agree with it. Is VOO just as S&P 500? I'm not sure of that ETF. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so I agree that probably 99% of investors won't outperform. Well, I don't know exact numbers, but roughly over 90% will not outperform the S&P 500, but it's something that I'm willing to take on that risk of trying to do. Um, and I'm not confident that I will do that. I think by investing with a different approach than most people, looking in an area of the market that no one else is looking, um, I would expect not to get market average results. And that could go either way. That could be to the upside or downside, but there's always the option over time, if you see you're a t if you're not capable of outperforming the market, there's always time to switch. So I figure since it's something I enjoy, it's something that I should at least try. Um, previously, I've spent more time invested in index funds than I have stock picking. So I've done about seven years where I had over half of my money um, in a globally diversified ETF. And then I had a little bit of stock picking on the side. Um, and I had market average results. I pretty much track the S&P 500 for seven years. Um, since switching to a stock picking strategy about three years ago, I have outperformed and that doesn't mean I'm going to continue to do that in the future, but um, it's at least promising to keep trying. Um, it obviously was better to do what I did than keep doing what I was doing. So until that's proven incorrect, then I think um, it's worth a shot. But generally speaking, most people, like Buffett has always said, should be invested in an index fund. Um, that's just not what I want to do. How do you Not guys said. think about that? Um, yeah, I don't know that I have a lot to add, to be honest. I think about it in a pretty similar way. Um, yeah, if it turns out that I'm completely useless at the stock picking stuff, then I will index eventually. Um, but I, I think I think the reason that most investors, like most individual investors, underperform picking individual stocks is because they don't have the right framework or temperament for it, basically. Um if you're on any sort of like Facebook page of some investment group, you kind of get a feel for how the average person, average individual person picks stocks and like rides momentum and reacts to daily news and all that sort of stuff. I think that tends to explain a lot of the underperformance of individuals. I, I think if you have a decent framework in place, you can, you can do well. So um, that's kind of how I view it. How about you, Jason? Uh, to be honest and not humble, the, the more I do this, the more I'm, confident that i will dramatically outperform it and then to give you guys a compliment the more i'm confident that you guys and will will dramatically outperform the market over time um i mean don't you guys kind of get the feeling like this stuff is understandable as much as you've studied it to this point and you understand the temperament stuff you have to bring to the game as well and you understand the technical stuff about like how do you outperform well focus investing you have to you can increase the likelihood that you will with with focus investing i just um i know people say no one no one beats the market and so on but look at the i mean look at the look at the chart behind our pictures you know um these guys are just guys and um there's plenty of people out there as well who are not famous who uh are amazing at investing um so i i i to be honest i don't think it's that difficult of a game to to kind of solve or beat i just think a lot of people are not smart and and even more people have or the same amount have horrible temperaments um and they let the price guide them and and they get fear and greed wrong and all that so to be honest with you yeah yeah i've been blown away over the past couple of years by the number of people that have kind of got involved in the stock market over the past couple of years um like how often they react to news or how often they trade or how they think about making investment decisions. It's kind of been like unbelievable to, <laughs> to see some of people's thinking out there. It's, um, it's, it's weird. Well, and, but, um, and I agree with that. And then on the inverse, you know, figuring out Thor or learning about like what makes a business grow, not growing the price of a business. To, as Buffett said, it doesn't it doesn't take a ton of intelligence. There's just a certain bar. Isn't that stuff seem pretty simple to you after you kind of get get it down? 
and then the temperament stuff as well yeah i think it's uh how do they say it? it's simple but not easy it's probably a good way of putting it well my point is if you have the right temperament isn't it easy then simple and easy because isn't if it's simple because it doesn't take a lot of iq why would it not be easy well probably the temperament for most people yeah that's fair tom i know you think you're going to crush the market <laughs> Trying to pull that out. Time will, t- time will tell. All right. Any other questions you guys want to tackle in there? Um, I appreciate this from Jonathan. Like, there's not that many places on the internet I find where you can have a rational uh, debate with people and they don't get super heated. So, I mean, you guys are the ultimate example of rational, not rationality, but like temperament in this style of investing. And look at the comments in the chat as you record and look at the comments on YouTube after the video. It's like even your audience. Half of them are nuts. So um, it's that's an a, easy that's game. That's a glass you, half you, empty you, approach, Jason. Half of them are geniuses. That's what we should be saying. And and the, the ones who I'm speaking of know who they are, the geniuses. So Stone cold killers. That's what half of them are. And in an investing context. Yeah. How about that question from uh, a favorite of mine, Chiffon, from one of the most recent ones? How about another question or comment from another favorite of mine, James? He said, hey, haha. I think that's worth highlighting because I like James. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> we love James. But uh, are you staying positive on this uh, down market and adding to your existing stocks? Jason. I want to answer that, but I want to I want to throw something to Frank, what I was curious about uh, before the show. Frank, over here in the United States, it's getting ugly. A lot of fear. S&P 500 is down 25% this year. And it's it's really ugly. Like every day, stocks are going down a lot. Uh, I was I was looking at an accounting company in Australia. Uh, their stock price, it, it seems to be doing fine. And I was curious, beyond that one, how are things in Australia right now? Like, I know you guys probably have the inflation issue that we have. But like, is the market down 25%? Are, are investors fearful and worried every day? Like, how are things down there? Um, I should know an answer to how the Australian market's been going. I, I could tell you it's down. I don't know how much buy. It's not something I follow. Um, okay. So you're more of a for, yeah, global guy in US and all that? Yeah. So if it wasn't for Twitter, I don't know if I would know that the market was down 25%. Um, I don't even follow my portfolio too closely. I check it. I used to check it once a week or so. Now it's been like once a month. Um, and my portfolio is about break even roughly on any given day. So without paying attention to Twitter and the noise, I wouldn't know that the market's doing so bad. <clears throat> gotcha. But um, to answer the question, it, it is just an opportunity in my mind. I don't know how long the market's down for. We might have 10 years of a sideways market. Like that's a macro call that I just, I don't know. I don't feel strongly about, but it's completely unknowable, but it's not going to change what I've always done with investing. So um, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. And if the market the market can do what it's doing, it doesn't really make a difference to me. Yeah. So just, just for context, um, S&P 500 down 25% year to date, ASX 200 in Australia down 14.7% and NZ top 50 over here down 15.85%. Yeah. So, so we're not as tech driven, which is, most of the correction come on the tech side of it, I would guess, which is why the US market's down a little bit more than our markets. Um, a lot of financials and uh, mining companies really in Australia. So they're obviously not hurt as much. Um, yeah, so it's down. It's significant, sure. but um, it's not something I pay attention to. Yeah, it is. Um, just so you have some context, like just on the ground over here, like it, it, it's beyond tech. Uh, it's a very much an interest rate like the federal reserve rising rates and people yeah being scared of the market but just to give you a couple examples fedex big delivery companies down 42 percent uh year to date uh walmart has held up fine uh it's only down 10 percent. but at one point uh it was down 24 percent from a recent high so uh, a lot of fear i gotta tell you i'm i'm on fire these days um doing incredibly aggressive things and my my investment horizon is 30 plus years and so this stuff is just literally a blip we won't even remember in terms of my timeline and i'm seeing things that are big opportunities and um 
And I understand this sentiment could continue for another decade. It could be the 70s. But again, my my timeline's 30 plus years and I am I'm fired up and in the past I've made a mistake during downturns. I've I've done a really good job of holding and uh, not paying attention to it and kind of checking out, but making the mistake of not taking advantage of the opportunities and this time I'm not making that mistake. I'm kind of very involved um, on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah, I'm feeling pre pretty positive about the whole thing as well, really. Um, I, for quite a bit of time now, I've had like a bunch of cash set aside for a home purchase, not quite how knowing much? how much of that cash I'd, <laughs> I'd need to get. I do want... <laughs> um, and what's your address of the new home, yeah. by the way? Way there. Oh, uh, you want to... <laughs> Yeah, everyone can come over and just stand in the background if they want. <laughs> no, but um, I've got a lot more like clarity on that, having actually got the purchase across the line now. So I've been putting a bit more cash to work in stocks. Um, and it's felt pretty good. Like I've um, yeah, been buying companies that earn 20% returns on equity and can reinvest most of it at one times book value. People can guess the company. But um, yeah, it feels good to be able to do that. So. Uh, yeah, I'm feeling okay. To be honest, um, the whole foreign exchange thing has probably dampened the impact to my portfolio. Um, it doesn't look as far down as it would be if I just looked in US dollar terms. Um, so that's been an interesting dynamic, but overall feeling really good, to be honest. Yeah, I think this is partly from the investors that we follow, but I genuinely get excited when the market's down. It's when the market's in a bull market that I'm concerned. Um, like even late 2021 or mid 2021 is where I was kind of the most concerned about my portfolio. Um, in 2020, when we've seen the downturn, as well as kind of now that's an opportunistic environment, uh, I'm finding lots and lots of opportunities, not too many that I'm pulling the trigger on, but usually I struggle to find one or two interesting names, but I think I'd have five to 10 at the moment that I find pretty interesting. So that kind of, yeah, I, I treat it as, an opportunity when the market's down. Yeah, Buff, yep. Buffett's, you all know this, but he said, uh, be be uh, fearful when others are greedy, just like you're saying, Frank, during 2021, and, and greedy when others are fearful. I'm adding on to that to remind myself not to be too greedy uh, when others are fear, fearful, because I, I very much am like wanting to buy a lot uh, of things, but I also understand the macro situation we are in. And so I am buying things and being very aggressive but i am also kind of like sitting there waiting thinking like you know if this thing does get a whole lot worse uh, i don't want to miss those opportunities as well not to the extent where i'm not going to buy anything today i am but i am kind of holding back a little bit looking three to six months out and thinking yeah this thing could keep going and things could get really bad in terms of uh stock prices mm -hmm. yeah feeling pretty good um all right what else you want to take here is there any other big investors i i i don't track come to this show. Should tackle no there's not there's not i don't i don't come to this show <laughs> um empty-handed i i have great respect uh for tom and i have more respect for frank and i know frank loves i'm kidding tom i know frank loves uh the smaller caps out there. So I want to I want to share a company that I found in Value Line uh, this week. Uh, Value Line has these uh, sections where they give different model portfolios, portfolios that have large dividends, portfolios that are going to grow a lot, and they highlight different companies and and share some highlights of what they're what's going on with them. And in the companies that had like were situated in the portfolio for a lot of growth. There was a the company with the most projected growth in that portfolio was a company called Cornet Digital, uh, K R N T, and it's like a one point three uh, billion dollar market cap. And I know I said small cap, Frank, so I'll make that a little That's smaller. That's a mega cap. Uh, I believe I believe they at least according to to Value Line they've got hundreds of millions of. Uh, cash and and no debt if I, if i'm not uh mistaken i'm gonna kind of look that up but uh, apparently pretty it's sure it's k-r-n-t cornet digital and uh some of the information on the online sites as it usually is is or often is is kind of incorrect so i'm gonna go straight to the source here in value line 
And what I'm seeing is no debt and $480 million of cash on that one point. And I'm seeing an even smaller, uh, well, $1.3 billion, $1.4 billion market cap. So possibly a billion enterprise value. And apparently what they're doing is they, it's an Israeli company, if I'm not mistaken, and they have created technology that allows clothing companies to print product um, on demand. And just like everybody, what happens with the market, they reported one quarter that was off a little bit. The market freaks out and the stock price is down from like 180 to like 25 or something. And Value Line is saying there could be a lot of growth. Company I had never, ever heard of from anyone. And so I wanted to not come empty handed tonight and kind of put it on everyone's radar and everyone can look into it. And uh, maybe there's some potential there. I, I have not uh, looked into it other than that. Uh, but I just found it today. I thought that was super interesting because uh, that's always a problem with these uh, clothing companies and, and companies that ship product is is the risk of inventory and getting those decisions uh, decisions correct we're seeing that with like the big box companies and and even uh some online retailers they did not get their uh inventory mix correct and now they have to discount a bunch of stuff well what if you don't have to have as much inventory on the books because or on the shelf because you can just print it on demand with this amazing technology i think that's kind of the thing and you can see a ton of sales growth there and it looks like they're they're profitable so yeah i don't think they're profitable over the last 12 months i was just looking through um, their margins are very low and very unstable would be the first thing that stands out. Um, and there was a bit of dilution as well. So they would have obviously been a beneficiary from COVID, which justifies some of the sell-off, I think. It probably got a little bit of that COVID bump and run up in price a little bit, but it has been an extreme pullback. If you want to pull up the share price, Tom, I think it's down like 80% or so. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm reading management has set aside um, tens of millions for buybacks coming up. I just read that, so... Um, that could be interesting as well. Should we anyway. take a time on this thing or what? Go for it. Oh, we got a super chat. Well, let's check out this one. Well, yeah, let's finish this one. Then we'll go to the super chat. Um, so I've already looked at the growth. Um, yeah, margins are all over the place. So maybe we look at a price to sales. Good Lord. It's coming. It's down a lot, but it's down from the moon. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, Just like, you know, not saying this is that, but that was kind of my situation with Carvana. Way up for whatever reason. The market put it way down and then it gets on your radar and it's something to, to look into. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. The, super- the main reason I would pass on that one would be the dilution and unstable margins. Um, but maybe once I knew the business better, that could change my mind on those two things. They don't always ruin a thesis, but um, from the surface level look, that's what I see at least. Yeah. Should we look at DTEA? We've got a super chat on that one. 20 million market uh, cap with 30 million in net assets. There's a couple of these. This is the right one. Market cap twenty million. Yeah, that must be the one. This is very small. What's the business do? Uh, shrink. Oh no. <laughs> um, what is the business? Specialty do? tea retailer in Canada and the United States. Hmm. This kind of reminds me of that. Um, what's that candle company on Australia that a bunch oh, of value dusk. guys are in? Dusk yeah. or something. I'm getting dusk vibes from this. Um, so the revenues on this one are getting smashed, just decreasing over time. I don't know. Are they selling selling off their stores or something? It's unprofitable. Not sure. Could need more info on this one. 20 million market cap, 30 million net assets, apparently. So anyway, um, have you guys looked into RH at all? <laughs> or- <laughs> so anyway. Um, well, I mean, well, I mean, what do you ne- want me to say? Like no one, we yep. don't know. 
we're gonna what's going yeah we're there? gonna need more info on that one joe uh, joe you tell us you know, what well, what's going on with this company what are those assets i'd be curious um but i was saying but anyway have you guys ever looked into rh uh not oh no not closely okay what's the deal with rh i know berkshire have a small position right or at least used to yeah they do um i think they bought it in 2019 or 2020 something like that and then the the stock price just zoomed up like 7x uh formerly called restoration hardware and since then it's come down and um I listened to the earnings call the the other night, and that was like uh, one of the most entertaining things I've ever heard in my life. Not just talking about earnings calls, but all content ever. The CEO at this company is it's 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 an amazing situation, and basically, uh, they're a furniture retailer. But this guy is like trying to single handedly, but along with his team, um, grow the company into an American luxury story and get into restaurants and hotels and airlines uh airplanes to, to a little bit of an extent uh, they have some jets that you can charter and uh some some other things as well like design services and all that and i gotta tell you i've, I've absolutely fallen in love i've already started buying very small but um it's a really really cool situation the valuation is like not that high at all and if they pull off this uh, story of, of becoming a, valued as the luxury company they are and that works, it could be like a, a spawner uh, like, like uh, Monish talks about. And it really could have a, a ton of growth. And I think you guys might kind of love uh, some of the things that the guy says on the earnings calls. And it, what I, what I, my, one of my takeaways was, one, this guy's a retail prodigy. If you look at his career, he started as like a stock boy at The Gap, ended up uh, running like 60 stores, went over to another company and like that company did great. And then has been at rest at RH for like 20 years. And it, it's it, to me, it seems like it's all him. But you can actually tell it's a guy running his business um, versus just like an everyday manager. He also owns 20 percent of the company. Uh, they also do uh, buybacks from time to time at, at the right times. Just a very, very interesting story. And then you layer all all of that on with the fact that you can buy it for less than Berkshire Hathaway did um, because they bought a little more of it uh, in the first quarter of this year. Very, very high up on my radar and something I'm looking very closely at right now and spending a lot of time at on. Right. So it's got to be looks like it's down about two thirds 66 percent, yeah yeah it's grown a lot jason i've noticed that you're you say you fell in love with this one. <laughs> i've noticed that you're prone to falling in love fairly frequently well you see the messages i send you late at night and uh <laughs> i am i am but um but but I mean, imagine finding a guy that doesn't care what the market thinks and understands his business and better than anybody and a company that Berkshire Hathaway bought and they're on my Mount Rushmore and the guy owns 20% of the business and there's a spawner situation here and a incredibly long runway. By the way, uh, they're getting into they're getting into housing as well. Um, so it, I don't know. It's just um, I do fall in love. Guy Spear has said, read the filings first. Uh, before you hear the more subjective stuff and that's definitely something i need to take to heart um but just for entertainment alone you guys should check out those uh recent earning calls yeah um i see we've got a super chat from tristan here as well uh getb two dollars for your troubles we must be the world's cheapest analysts i think <laughs> yeah i think you are and a little listener feedback from a fan sitting right here I mean, I'll stop there. No, do it. G no, no, no. Uh, GETB. You guys, you know, this is, uh, they're going to pay you two bucks and say jump and you say how how high? Send it this back. Is a, Send this it is back. a company that is interesting though. Tristan, to be fair, just to give context to who Tristan is. Yeah. Um, Kelly Partners Group, the idea came directly from him. So yeah. if he shares a stock, it's worth reading. The $2 is a yeah, favor okay. to us. Okay, I appreciate, I appreciate um, that. I, I think... 
Take Tristan's the money back. Take it back. Don't give it back. Don't give it back. Um, yeah, do, so you, give, do you know a bit of the backstory on this one? Uh, only briefly from things he's shared with me. I haven't done the work, but it's like a software company. I think it's like document management or workflow management or something like that. Um, and from memory, I think there's three or four businesses, kind of software softwares that they run, um, like B2B kind of business. And one of them is very profitable. Um, they're all annual sticky recurring revenues. Um, and the other two, I think, are just reaching profitability. So it's kind of at an inflection point of profitability. Um, maybe if you want to check the sales multiples, I think it's trading about two times from memory, one or two times annual recurring revenues. Um, that might not show exactly in here, I guess. With Yeah, but that, that was the thesis behind it. I think it's a, it's a small company, sticky revenues, reaching an inflection point of profitability. So it's one worth looking at. Um, not sure if it's one I could understand well with the type of products that they are offering. Um, doesn't seem overly complicated, I guess, but um, it, it is interesting for sure. Mm. And this is in the UK by the looks of it? Yeah. What is the market cap? I know it's small. I don't know how small. Um, in US dollars, 29 million. Yeah. So I guess you call yeah. that a nano cap at that point. Mm. micro cap nano cap um yeah very small interesting company trading pretty cheap cool. but that's the extent i know of it i tristan would know a lot more than we obviously do but definitely one to add to people's watch list yeah people should go follow tristan on twitter tristan if you want to drop your handle in the chat um feel free let's let's maybe put a halt to ticker time <laughs> but, um, <laughs> any more questions in here you guys want to tackle or if people have a few more questions, uh, we'll stay I mean, for a few sh more minutes. Should I, should I respond to these comments about speed bag investing and I have too many punches? If, if people knew the allocation size that I put into the country of Turkey, they would cry. Uh, if, people, if people knew the allocation size I put into Alphabet, they would wet themselves. Uh, I don't have too many, too many punches. Um, and the other thing, Tom, because you, you kind of got this bandwagon started, about falling in love you're you have survivorship bias uh there's plenty of businesses um including some that have been featured tonight uh that i just pass instantly uh because i kind of don't understand the industry or something doesn't click with me but someone mentioned uh that i'm on to something with rh and that's kind of my process uh with investing is i kind of get a scent and i kind of get some feelings like i kind of see patterns like all the stuff i talked about with rh insider buying big ownership um a, a huge runway and i that's when i get very interested and and sometimes i do fall in love i think maybe i'm just very vocal when i fall in love but um plenty of passing as well so yeah and i've noticed you you often start with much smaller positions than probably someone like me or frank would even bother putting in the portfolio right well, sometimes I go huge, but uh, other times I just go, you know what? There's something going on with RH. I've been working out at night, doing some like jogging and listening to this guy's earnings calls. I'm falling in love. I just want to see what it's like to be a shareholder, even to a very, very small extent, and just kick it into gear and, and get something started. And uh, I see someone's mentioning a bank. Um, that's an example because I know you're very uh, interested in banks, Tom. For whatever reason, they just don't click with me. Uh, and so there's like a Berkshire investment in the Ally Bank. I, I look at it for five seconds and then I just go, you know what? I really just don't understand banks. They don't click with me. They don't draw me and I, I pass. So I guess that's why I'm so excited is it, it does take a lot for me to find something that I, I see has big, big enough potential to get interested in. Yeah, fair enough. What else have we got in here? Tristan uh, are you his handle there if you wanted to pull it up just for people. Uh, there he is. On Twitter, well worth the follow. Definitely. Frank, do you know there's rumors that Mark Zuckerberg might fight MMA this weekend in Las Vegas in the UFC? <laughs> I, I know there's rumors that he bought out the entire arena and it's going to be an empty crowd. And did you know for the fir first time and maybe ever they're not allowing the media to an event? Yeah, so the rumor I've heard is that he's trying to do some kind of um, 
virtual watch experience or something like the metaverse come to real life, the crowd uh, virtual. I don't know. It's all speculation at this point, but interesting. My favorite fighters headline that one. Mackenzie Dern. My girl, Mackenzie Dern, future champ. Jiu-Jitsu specialist. Yeah, she likes uh, she likes keeping it on the feet as well, though. I mean, I've, I've pitched a I pitched a podcast to Tom just so everyone knows. He turned me down, and uh, I'm all, I've also pitched a podcast to Frank where we talk MMA. He's turned me down, but um, <laughs> I'd love to talk more MMA with you, Frank. Uh, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see what happens. Um, are you guys? You know, Karan's talked a little bit about Warner Brothers Discovery. Do either of you look at the streamers at all? Netflix on down? Because I've been looking uh, at Paramount. Yeah, I've looked at Netflix a little bit, but too hard for me outside of that. I mean, a lot of these streaming services don't even offer their, you know, product in New Zealand. So it's it's wow, okay. it's tough. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, I, I can look at the Netflix big ones. Like, Australia. Disney and Netflix. Uh, and sorry. Disney, yeah. Yeah. I don't think we've got HBO Max or wow. anything like that from memory. So when you when you buy yeah. this new house, what do you do with all this money that you have besides buy stocks? Like what do you do for content? Um <laughs> do, do you guys do um, you guys still buy cable or a big satellite dish? No. <laughs> what do we do? We've got uh Netflix and Disney Plus, although considering canceling disney plus and yeah, um canceled. yeah wow. and with the internet with the internet we got here we actually got um six months free of prime so i've been watching a bit yeah. of stuff on there but um that's so some stream so some streaming no linear like no cable no satellite no in terms of yeah, just you have, okay. connected if i if i want to watch anything on like sort of quote unquote regular tv um i actually just go on the apps that are set up for that and stream particular shows um gotcha yeah that's kind of the way i do it so my kind of paramount it's another company that berkshire hathaway i think bought in the first couple quarters of this year and from the low in those two quarters it's it's 29 percent lower company i'm looking at a lot at, at a lot i've i've made some purchases uh of it and um i've also looked at warner brothers discovery a lot and just a little scuttlebutt i've heard um from advertisers my, my whole theory of these companies after uh, looking into them quite a bit is that where they want to go is essentially um, free or near free for every for most of their audience and like free. And they even say this in the presentation for Warner's Warner Brothers Discovery, where they want to go is fast, free, ad supported streaming television. And I think it's an advertising play. And I talked to a very large kind of local business advertisers that advertises across an entire state here in the U.S. and does a lot of like uh, broadcast advertising and cable advertising. They are now going into streaming advertising uh, to get the same benefit, which is like get in front of a bunch of people, build your brand and awareness and all that kind of stuff. But with the streamers, you actually have to sit through the ads. And I've experienced this myself on Peacock and uh to some extent paramount uh when you're on an ad tier you have to sit through the ads you can't fast forward through them so that's beneficial to advertisers and then you get a lot more choice in technology and data than you do with linear and so um it's like the only way you can reach that kind of audience still is, is television for that kind of advertising and i don't think enough credit has been given to these streamers in terms of where they could go with their advertising product in terms of having the same reach they have today for the same kind of advertising, but layering on that technology and those, that data and those options. And just from a little scuttlebutt from one advertiser, uh, they're, they're loving it. And um, I I think it it could be a a very cool thing. Yeah. Does that impact Google? You think, or YouTube? Uh, So it's a, it's a different, um, some of what Google does is a different form of advertising search performance, advertising less about the brand and more about like, what did we just get for that click? Did they buy something on our website? Uh, But Google obviously has YouTube and that, that is to some extent, it's a mix of both. Um, And then Google also has um, YouTube TV, which is essentially 
cable, but through the form of streaming and you get all these channels um, and DVR and all that kind of stuff. And I don't know to what extent they're making money from it. Uh, it seems to be a very small amount of their income, um, but they're in that game as well. Um, and I think the streamers, they are definitely competition with YouTube, uh, but YouTube, I think like we're all examples of this. We watch YouTube, but we also watch streamers. Yeah. And uh, just while we're on the topic, Lazy Investor brings up a good point. 54 watching and only nine likes. I've just refreshed the stream on YouTube and I think we're up to 20, but if you guys could, those are rookie numbers. So if, if you guys could, could bump those up, it'd be great. <laughs> that's a, that's on you, Tom. Jack Jack asks us like uh, every five Jack's minutes. Like a, yeah, Jack's about 15,000 times better at hosting than me. So that, I'll take no, responsibility no, no. for that. Um, all right, another super chat from Jonathan. Tom, enlighten these folks on Ronald Reed. Do you guys know who Ronald Reed is? Before I dive into it. I don't think so. I, I, re I read that I'm like sure seven, you've heard seven, seven times in the comments. I saw Ronald, 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 and I thought he was just giving praise to Ronald Reagan. I I had no idea it was <laughs> Ronald Reed. No, although I've just learned, because I just wanted to double check this as the story I was thinking of. When you go to type Ronald Reed into Google, it does suggest Ronald Reagan. But no, Ronald Reed was That's the true. janitor that... Um, kept basically um saving and investing throughout his career i don't know oh what but it's exactly. so it's so hard to beat the market how did he do it tom yeah but well i i jonathan might know but um ronald reed worked as a janitor from memory and never earned more than i don't want to put a number out there for what his salary was but something not particularly impressive um and he amassed an $8 million fortune from just consistently investing small amounts of money. So nice story to look back at. So Jason, you can get rich. Yeah. It, uh, I'm telling you guys, if it's, if it's not that hard, it's not that hard. I think it's more temperament and this guy must've had the right temperament or obviously did. Yeah, for sure. Uh, super chat here from Ben. Um, who has hit me with sheep jokes before, but we'll ignore those. Um, <laughs> ben asked about DJ Co, small micro cap. Is it something you've had a look at? Frank, Matt from Peterson Capital Management has done extensive research over the years. Um, well, it's a better question for Tom, I guess. I haven't looked at it in detail. It's a pretty quick pass for me. Um, I know they're probably trying to discount, discount to their portfolio. They have the journal technologies aspect that, there's very little public information available to kind of value that in any way. Um, some people speculate that's worth a lot and there's a lot of these hidden contracts that are worth a lot of money. Um, I don't know, Tom, you can probably cover that one better than me. Yeah, um, people should just go watch my video from a couple of weeks ago. But um, yeah, I did a, did an update on the DJ Co portfolio. Um, just bringing it up here. So... By my maths, uh, this was maybe a week or so ago. By my maths, the, if you put a, if you put a dollar into DJ Co stock, about fifty eight cents of that is going into what I've just called like net invested assets, which is mainly the stock portfolio, but a little bit of real estate, and then backing out or adjusting for any cash debt and uh, capital gains tax liability should they actually liquidate the portfolio. Uh, and about 42 cents on the dollar is going into journal technologies, which um, values it at about $140 million. And Matt Peterson makes a case that it's worth half a billion dollars in about a decade's time conservatively. So, um, yeah, kind of interesting equation. Although a lot of your money in reality is going towards bank stocks, some BYD and a little bit of Alibaba. So, um I guess you got to get comfortable with that element as well as there's just a lot of unknowns because management don't openly talk a whole lot about what's actually happening at journal technologies. But yeah, it's interesting. I think if it got, if it got cheap enough um, and the downside sort of evaporates, it might be worth looking at a little closer or if there's more disclosure on journal technologies. I mean, they've got a new, new CEO just this year. So I wouldn't rule that out either. Can we pull up that comment from Tristan and wrap it up on the goat? The real uh, goat. 
we can't. <laughs> now we've heard enough about Brit. The goat. We're talking oh, best track oh, records. Re- there it is. In the comments, <laughs> the people can see no, it. They know what's up. Yeah. Brett <laughs> Kelly has compounded over 60% since 2006 on personal capital. Yeah, Brett's a beast. He also is, um, I've learned, a big proponent of your network is your net worth. Um, in the Berkshire line, he showed us his contacts on his phone, and I forget the number, but it was in the like several thousands of people um, whose phone numbers he, he had. He just he just swaps details with anyone he meets by the sounds of it. So He also had a recent too. podcast with Dr. Shaquille O'Neal. He did, yeah. He's he's gone viral a few times from some of those <laughs> clips, eh? Hey? Yeah. Like yeah. on Instagram and TikTok and a few other places. Thanks to Brett. I'm not Shaq. Yeah. Shaq's a shareholder, I believe, of KPG now. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> that I that's true, isn't it? Didn't um Brett give him I think it might be, I don't know. It shares. was they talked about it in the podcast, but I don't know if they were serious. Yeah, I, I think he's a small shareholder. Um yeah. And you almost got really diluted, I think, in that podcast too. Shaq was gonna get a million shares or something if um he if made, he made a free shot. throw. But he missed, so <laughs> you're safe. <laughs> but on that note, we better wrap it up. We're almost an hour and a half into this thing. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um it's been fun. Jason, great to have you yeah. on here. Great um, to be here. Any final words of wisdom for the people, Jason, before we wrap this up? No, I just want to give a special shout out to Jack out there somewhere. Um, I miss him. We <laughs> miss Jack? him. And yeah, just Jack. Uh, I've been on here twice in the last few weeks and he hasn't been here. So I know he's got a lot going on and just looking forward to seeing him back in the captain's chair. Me too. Me too. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Uh, let me just figure out how to roll this outro music. Get your ears ready. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to Punch Card Investing. The contents of this show should not be used as investment advice or as a recommendation to invest in a particular security. Please consult with a licensed investment advisor if you need investment advice. All investments carry risk and the potential for monetary loss. Thank you and see you next week.